Bible studies were lifted uh, directly off the transcripts of the late Bishop R.P. Paddock, who taught a series that I have on tape in my office. Actually, it's in our, it's in our computer system now. Uh, he was teaching, I don't know what year it was, but at the late Bishop, um, I'm trying to remember, he, the late Suffolk and Bishop Mac Ray's church, I dare say probably back in the 80s, teaching this particular subject on building up yourselves. And so um, I went listening to it, and I decided, well, I guess it would probably be a good subject to teach in as much as we are certainly in those times where um, we need to build up ourselves on our most holy faith. Can the church say amen? It was actually 11, look, I think it was like in a, a 10 tape, 11 tape series, um, 10 or 11 tapes, depending on how you split it up. But in any case, that he taught this particular subject um, at that assembly, and it was, it made an impression upon me um, because, saints, we're living in those times where we have to do everything that we can do to make sure that we are spiritually built up and ready um, for the soon coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he's coming, as we said, um, Sister, um, in a day and in an hour when we think not, Sister Hayes, that's what the scripture said. And so this is how it's going to be, and he's coming back for those that have built themselves up and made themselves ready. This particular Bible study, saints, deals with the personal uh, obligation and responsibility of the born-again believer to do these three things that we're going to give you in a few minutes, which we gave you uh, in previous Bible classes, uh, in order for them to make sure that they're ready when the Lord comes. Can the church say amen? amen. And so, if this is done within our hearts, then when the Lord shows up, we will make it when he comes, because God did not save anybody to be lost. Praise the Lord. God saved us to be saved. As I've said before and I'll say again, we were saved, we are saved, and we are being saved. And so this is the journey of the New Testament believer, just as the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, there was approximately, um, if you do um, a calculation, it should have took them only about 11 days at best to get to the promised land. But because of their unbelief and their inability to accept uh, the word of God and walk with God, it took them, somebody say, 40 years. 40. And the wilderness experience of the children of Israel saints is a type of the experience that happens with the child of God when he comes out of the world and is on their way or on our way to heaven because we are still in the wilderness of this world, but yet being in this world, the Bible said we're not of the world. Can the church say amen? So why did God give us all, why did God give us all those examples in, um, in, in jewelry for those 40 years? Was to show us the do's and the don'ts of making a successful journey. Can the church say amen? amen. A successful journey to see the Lord. Because the promised land, Bishop, was a type of heaven. Can the church say amen? amen. And when they came out, they were supposed to be sh sh uh, making a dash to the finish line. But because of circumstances that we all understand and see in the scripture, they didn't make it. Some didn't make it. Some did. Some didn't make it. But I'm going to make it. We have to be determined to make it. And this particular Bible, Bible class deals with that fact of these three things that every single born-again believer has to do in order to make sure that they're ready. So let's go to um, Jude, verses numbers 20 and 21 as a place to start. Let's read it again. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So the three things that we have to do 
in order to keep ourselves in the love of God, number one is building up ourselves on our most holy faith. Number two, which we're going to deal with tonight, is praying in the Holy Ghost or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And number three is looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And we dealt with that portion of it, the expectation that we have of his coming. We dealt with this particular Bible class in the reverse. The main thrust of the study is how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? by doing these three things. If anybody gets these three things done properly in their life, they will be ready and they will be in the love of God. They will be in the hand of God. They will be in the place of his favor, the place of his spirit, the place of his blessing if they do these three things. As we preached on Sunday night when Jesus was dealing with the, the Jews in the presence of the apostles, because there were some Jews that simply did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And he makes the point in the 10th chapter, I think it is of the book of, of St. John, he says, I, I, I'm, don't quote me, and we may have to go there, but in any case, he talked about the fact that if they were, of, if they were his fathers, then they would hear him. But he, and then he looks, he dealt with his disciples, and he told them that God gave you to me, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and no man, now I'm paraphrasing here, no man can pluck you out of my hands. Amen. Can the church say amen? Now, saints, they were in the hands of God, and so is the church. We are in the hands of God because we follow their example. We are apostolic in doctrine, and we are Pentecostal in practice. We practice the apostolic doctrine, thus putting us, Brother Nick, in the hands of God or in his bosom in his favor. Can the church say amen? We have the blessing upon us because we're where the blessing resides that is in him. And so that ties in directly to our subject. These three things are paramount for the child of God to be in the love of God. Now I made the point in a previous Bible class because it is a great misconception that people feel that God loves everybody equally. He doesn't love everybody equally. He loves the church with a manner of love that is different than the world. The manner of love that he loves the world is that he gave himself a ransom for many. The manner of love that he loves the church is that he puts us in the love of God or in the blessing or favor of God once we receive his love. Just like a mother and her child has a certain type of love that is different than the child that lives down the street. Now she loves, she may love the child that lives down the street, but she doesn't love the child that lives down the street like she loves her own child. Just like a husband has for his wife. He may love his mother, but he should not, if he's any, if he's any type of man as far as I'm concerned, should love his mother greater than he loves his wife. Some y'all not y'all not feeling me, but it's the truth because the Bible said for this reason a man is supposed to what? Leave his mother and father and cleave to his own wife. Can the church say amen? amen? And that's the that's the type of love to a certain degree that God has for the church. We are in we are his beloved. We're at the top of the totem pole. We're at the top of the top when it comes to his love. So hence. Once, Brother Bobby, we get in the love of God, the writer here says, keep yourselves in the love of God. And in order for that to take place, these three things have to be operating in our life. So we dealt with number one or number three in the reverse. We talked about looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now we're going to deal with praying in the Holy Ghost. One of the keys of us being able to stay in the love of God is learning how to pray in the Holy Spirit to stay in the will of God because we're living in a day, saints, where communication with God is at a minimum. Because now, now somebody said, well, Pastor, how do you get to the, come to that conclusion? If people were talking to God the way they should, then their actions would depict that. Praise the Lord, because God, through the Holy Spirit, deals with us in prayer 
as to what and how we are supposed to order our life. Can the church say amen? amen. And so the point is, is that God wants his church to make sure those individuals that are in it, of course, to be praying in such a way that they are in direct communication with somebody, say the Lord. Amen. So let's go now to Ephesians as a place to start this particular part of our subject. Um, praying in the Holy Ghost, or praying under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number 6. And verses numbers 18. Are you with me? All right, God bless you. It is too kind tonight. And we're going to see how much we're supposed to pray in the Holy Ghost in reading this verse. This is the point by reading this particular verse. Because there are many things that people are talking about today. But the only thing that matters is what we do in terms of talking to God because he can do something about it. Can the church say amen? Let's read here verses number 17 is what we want. Praying sometimes with all prayers and supplication of the Spirit. Y'all let me get away with that. What did he say? Praying always. Now this has to do with the individual being, um, of course, in an attitude where they're able to pray. Now we all understand that our busy lifestyles, we're not always able to pray at um, a particular point in time. But this speaks of us being in a readiness to be able to pray. Amen. Can the church say amen? That has to do with our spirit, our hearts, our minds are in such a, such a place where we can pray at any time. Another scripture says it, says it like this. When you pray, enter into your closet. Now that's not a physical place, that's a spiritual place. That is a place that you enter in between you and God and you get in contact with the Lord. So he says here, praying always with prayer, with all prayer and supplication in the what? Spirit. Now, how are we supposed to pray? In the spirit. And one of the reasons why many prayers do not get answered is because many prayers are not prayed in the spirit. They're not prayed under the influence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is the vehicle that God has given us to get into the presence of God. The Bible said we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And the question may be asked, well, where is the throne of grace? The throne of grace is in your heart because God sits on the throne of our hearts. So when we are praying under the influence of the Holy Ghost, entering into the presence of God in a secret place within us where our prayers become effectual, they become effective as God's Holy Spirit works within us. I'm going to give you a scripture in a few minutes to make the point that the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. And we're going to give you that scripture in a few minutes. So the point here is that when we pray, we should first of all be ready to pray always. That has Our attitude should be in such a, 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 such a way where we are able to pray. Now, what, now, how, now, let me illustrate that to you. If I'm ready to pray and have an attitude of prayer, that means my mind is in a place where I could get into the presence of God at any time. You get the picture? Now, how, how can that take place? It takes place when a person is under the influence of God's Spirit in their life. They're walking in such a way to where they could get into the presence of God at any time and get a prayer through. Now, do you have to open up your mouth to get a prayer through? No. Praise the Lord. Do you, do you open up your mouth to get a prayer through sometimes? Yes. But the point is, this is speaking of us being ready to pray, ready to supplicate. Now, the term supplication speaks of us speaking to God, in many cases, on the behalf of somebody else, if I can use that terminology. We're supplicating, a lot of times we're supplicating, we're actually praying on the behalf of a situation or somebody else in intercession. Can the church say amen? Supplicating, open up our mouth, 
opening up our hearts and speaking to God. So one of the tools that God has given us in building up ourselves on our most holy faith is praying in the Holy Ghost. The latter part of this verse makes the point that we should, of course, supplicate in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all, what? Perseverance, read, and supplication for me, for all saints. So what, what should we be doing? We should be supplicating for somebody say, everybody. There's an old adage. I don't know if you guys know this. Um, Bishop Paddock used this, and I guess I have to use it. Most of our prayers that we pray has to do with our own needs. But many of the prayers that are effectual to God are prayers that we pray on behalf of somebody else. He used the adage. He said, um, he talked about the old saying, God bless me my wife, our son John, his wife, us four, and no more. That's what he said. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And he may also made a statement. He said in, in the 60-some years of his ministry, he never prayed for himself. That's what he said. Now, that's not my testimony. I'm just giving you his. And um, the late Bishop Brisbane would say in many cases when he got down to pray and began to pray for the needs of others, God would meet his needs. And that is a, a, a direct fulfillment to a certain degree of this scripture. Because the scripture said God knows what we have need of. Praise the Lord. But God will use the prayer of the individual that gets into the presence of God to intercede on the behalf of all saints. Can the church say amen? So one of the tools that God has given us to enrich to benefit, to edify, to build up the body is that he uses the Holy Spirit within the believer to pray for somebody else. Our prayers affect, uh, 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 is effective in three ways. Number one, it, our prayers affect the world, our prayers affect the church, and our prayers affect us. These are basically the three areas that we can be effective in our prayer. Somebody say prove it. I'm going to prove it to you then. The Bible said that we're supposed to pray for magistrates, pray for kings, right? Pray for those in leadership. So I don't like the president. So what? Pray for him because if we don't pray for the man, we, he may do something crazy. Can the church say hallelujah? Somebody said that's hard. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's hard to do. We should pray for what? Our enemies. Isn't that right? Amen. We pray for the children of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we pray for the general condition of our world. Because the general condition of the world affects us to a certain degree. Amen. Can the church say amen? amen? Pray for those in leadership. Pray for the Grand Rapids Police Department. Pray for the Kentwood Police Department. Well, they do it. Well, pray for them that God would help them. Because I guarantee you, when you need them to show up, you don't want him to get a flat tire. Can the church say amen? I, am I making sense? So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter our individual personal issues with those who are in power. What matters is that we obey the scripture so that God will be glorified. Can the church say amen? I'm praying for these people. Why? Because I want to make sure that I can go to bed at night, lock my doors, and be at peace. Can the church say amen? And so we should be praying for somebody to say everybody. But in this case, Paul makes the point to the Ephesian church that all prayers and supplication should be given for all saints. Now let's go to Romans chapter number um, 8. Can the church say amen? Any good? Amen. Praise the Lord. I know people have their personal opinions, and everybody has an opinion. Praise the Lord. But at the end of the day, we want God to be glorified. Isn't that right? Now, this scripture is going to make the point that it is the spirit that helpeth our infirmities. And he's going to give us, Bishop, what our infirmities are. They are not just weaknesses in our flesh. It's more than that. So let's read here. Likewise, the spirit, are we, verse number 26, Romans 8 and 26. Are you with me? All right. I'll, I hear pages turning. I'm going to wait. I hear pages turning. 
He's going to tell us what our weakness is in this verse. Now, infirmities are weaknesses, but it goes deeper than this weaknesses in the natural flesh. Read here, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. The term infirmities are weaknesses. Everybody has them. Read. For we know not what we should pray for, all, for, uh, for as we ought. So what is the weakness that the Holy Ghost helps? That we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. That is the weakness or the infirmity that the Holy Spirit helps in prayer. Is that we don't know what we should be praying for. So what happens? The Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever been there. Where you're praying and you feel your, your prayer becomes effectual. And you begin to speak in tongues, in many cases, your prayer language, as the Spirit of God gives utterance. You don't know what you're praying for, but the Holy Spirit is interceding on the behalf, in many cases, of someone else. Have you ever been praying and someone comes to your mind? You don't know what the need is, but God intercedes with groaning and utterances. We're going to read it in a few minutes. That cannot be understood. You don't, you don't have to know what the problem is. But God can use the Holy Spirit in us to pray and intercede on somebody else's behalf to help them. That's how it works. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. Now, if you've you you never been there, keep praying and you'll get there. But here's the point. This is how God helps the church to be edified, to be built up. Is that God will come in and he will intercede in us on the behalf of all saints. Amen. On the behalf of the world. On the behalf of our families. On the behalf of individuals that we don't even know what the problem is. Sometimes I'm praying, I don't even know what it is. But I'm praying, the Holy Spirit come, kicks in, somebody comes to my mind, I begin to pray. My prayer language takes over and God is interceding. What is the problem? I have no clue what it is. But God knows what it is. Amen. And the weakness is that in many cases, we don't know what to pray for. But the Holy Spirit helps that and gives us, as we enter into the throne of grace, into the presence of God, in our hearts, God begins to move on the behalf of the needs of somebody else. Can the church say amen? Now, this has to do primarily with what God uses in his people as they pray in the Holy Ghost to help his church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You get the picture? So let's keep reading here. We, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself, the Spirit, you see that, that capital S? That is the Holy Spirit that God puts within the heart of the believer when they come into the church. That spirit intercedes with what? But the spirit itself maketh intercession for who's the us? The church. The Holy Spirit in us makes intercession, read, with groanings and utterances that cannot be understood. See, the point here is that there are times when we don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to pray. Have you ever got down to pray and didn't know what to say? Amen. Bishop Paddock used this. This is just not my testimony because I've never been there. But he made a point in a Bible class where he, there was an issue within the church. And he was asking God to help him. And he was praying and didn't get an answer. And he got down one time to pray. And he tried to speak and couldn't say a word. And all he could do was groan. And God solved the problems. And this scripture came, I guess, back to his mind that God intercedes with groanings that cannot be understood. Sometimes you will get to a place in your walk with God where you don't have the words to say. But all you can do is, is this in your spirit, cry out to God. And God knows exactly what it is. And you know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit helping your infirmity. Because sometimes when, when individuals think they know how to pray, their prayer that they're praying inhibits 
the intercession of God as he wants to come in and fix it. I learned this a long time ago. Never tell God how to fix a problem. Let him fix it the way he wants to fix it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because God knows how to fix it. Sometimes the reason why individuals may not come out of a situation as fast as God wants them to come out is because, to a certain degree sometimes, Bishop, they're praying and asking God for the wrong thing. Now, I'm going to give you a scripture in a few minutes to make that point. The Bible said in the book of James that they asked amiss. Now, here's the point. The only prayer, saints, that is effectual to God is prayers that are prayed in the Spirit. Any prayer that is not prayed in the Spirit is like shooting a, shooting a dart. And what do they call that? Somebody help me. What, what, the target, whatever it is. What, 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 is that what they call it? Dart board. Praise the Lord. Thank you. The, and you and, the, and let's just say the only time that you can score is if you hit a bullseye. Now, I know there's other, other places you can score in there, but the only credit you get is for hitting the bullseye. Praise the Lord. That's how our prayers have to be. When they're prayed in the spirit, they hit the mark. They hit exactly where God wants them to be. So when, a, so when Jude is talking about praying in the Holy Ghost, the way that we keep ourselves in the love of God is that we learn how to seek God in such a way that our prayers are effectual. Our prayers have a purpose. Our prayers meet the mark that God wants them to meet. Can the church say amen? All right, let's finish reading this. And he searches the heart. That who's the he here? That is Jesus. But is he in the form of the spirit? Because it is he that is interceding within us through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So the he here is Jesus in us. In one place it is called an it. When he or when he the spirit of truth have come. And here it is a he also. It is also called an it. But this it here is the Holy Spirit in us or Jesus. Can the church say amen? And what is he doing? And he searches the heart and knoweth what is the mind of the spirit. Or God searches the heart, as it were, of the believer and knows what is needed for us. And he intercedes as we yield our bodies over to him in prayer. He comes in and meets the need. Praise the Lord. He knows what is the mind of the spirit or his spirit. He knows what is needed within his body. But he uses us saints as a means of getting that done. Can the church say amen? He knows, Bishop, that you may have a need in your body. I don't know what it is, but I can start praying in the spirit God knows what is the mind of the Spirit, and he will give me the inner, he will intercede through my prayer to help his need. Praise the Lord. Well, who gets the glory? God does. Can the church say amen? But if I'm on my knees and I'm saying, Lord, bless me, my wife, my son John, us four and no more, then he don't get any help because my prayer is only me. Can the church say amen? When our prayer saints if they're prayed properly, most of our prayers should be for others. Now, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to be that hard, but it's just the way it is. Praise the Lord. I don't know how many times I get called, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. And, 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 and I'm, okay, well, I'll pray. And to the point that sometimes I don't have time to pray for myself. But God knows what I need, and he still helps me. Get the church say amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Somebody say hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Let's get off that because he, who is he, the Holy Spirit, what? Maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So where does God make the intercession? He makes the intercession in you through the Holy Spirit because he knows what is the needs for the body. Can the church say amen? So let's go now to, let's see here. Let's go to the fourth chapter. No, let's go to James. Let me give you this scripture here. James, chapter 1, I think it is. Praise the Lord. 
What are we talking about tonight? Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. The second part of this is praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's the point we want to make here in this particular Bible class. I think it's the first chapter. Praise the Lord. Let me see here. I'm going off memory here now. So you guys have to give me, be patient with me. All right. Let me see here. What verse do I want? Oh, no. Let's go to the fourth chapter. Verses numbers one through four. I'm sorry that I, I, my notes were right. I thought I thought it was wrong. Now James is writing to keep in mind here, baptize and fill believers. He's writing to people that have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he's going to make a point here. Read, for whence cometh wars and fightings among you? You mean the saints would fight? Yes. Can the church say Amen? Read, come they not hence of your own lust, what is war in your members. When people are not praying in the Holy Spirit, there is a level of lust that begins to rise up within them. And he's speaking to saints that because they were not walking in the Spirit and not praying in the Spirit, there was wars among them. Praise the Lord. And he makes the point of where those wars came from. It came from the strong desires that were in their heart. He's going to make the point when they were asking God for things, they wasn't getting them because it was something wrong with their prayers. See, God does not answer every prayer. Do you guys believe that? For God to, an for God to hear is for God to answer. Because the only prayers that we get credit for or God hears is the prayers that are offered according to his will. Because he knows what is the mind of the Spirit and he makes intercession through us according to the will of God. You get the picture? I could pray for 50 years, Lord, make me a millionaire. Help me hit the lottery. And you know what's going to happen? God is, not gonna, God is not going to hear that prayer. And then somebody said, well, I hit the lottery and it was God. No, that was the devil. Praise the Lord. <laughs> or that was your own will putting, putting, pushing you to do that. And it was this so happened that you got what you wanted contrary to the scripture. Praise the Lord. Because some people think that every time that they pray, God hears them. Well, God is not hearing stuff that is offered contrary to the scripture. If I pray a prayer, Lord, get him, get on him. God's not hearing that prayer because it's offered contrary to the scripture. I shouldn't be praying for God to chastise and get people. Praise the Lord. I should be praying for God to what? Save people. Get the church saved, man. You get the picture? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, verse number two. Read, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and it cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So that means that is this not something that an individual could have? Yes, they can have, but they're asking the wrong way. See, they were asking, and this is this illustration here, they were asking for God to do certain things for them and to give them things that wasn't theirs and or they didn't need. They were trying to obtain it the wrong way. So this was something that was lawful. Let me give you an example. I want to be in your shoes, Bishop, so I'm going to do everything. I'm going to ask God to give me your position, to give me your, give me your stature. And how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it by somehow tearing down you to get to where you, to get to where you are. That's asking a mess. Or praying in such a way to consume it upon lust, as he's going to show us in the next verse, the wrong way. And sometimes that happens with individuals. I'm just simply giving you an illustration to show you the difference between praying in the spirit and praying in the flesh. 
Can the church say amen? amen? We should pray like Jesus said, not our will be done, but thine will be done. Can the church say amen? amen. Let your kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's a manner of how a person is supposed to pray. So when we're being built up in the spirit, saints, we should be praying in such a way that God's, God would be glorified in the midst of our prayer. Can the church say amen? And sometimes God will put someone within your mind as you're praying. This has happened. If you keep praying long enough, it'll, it'll happen. And if we yield to the baptism of the Holy Ghost in us, we will begin to intercede for their, for their needs. And in the midst of that, God will meet your need. Even without you asking. Because you have fulfilled the scriptures in allowing the Holy Spirit to intercede in your heart for somebody else. But these individuals were warring. They were fighting. They were trying to get things to consume upon their lust. Now this wasn't this him making this up. This was an actual occurrence. So he's speaking to individuals that had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but yet were trying to obtain things the wrong way, asking for things the wrong way, and thinking that God was going to give it to them their way. God gives to us saints what he wants us to have, Brother Casey, his way. Can the church say amen? And we can never circumvent the process of God that he takes us through to give us what he wants to give us. So what, are we, what is our subject here? Praying in the Holy Ghost. When a person is praying under the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they are always allowing God's will to be done in the midst of their intercession. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Whatever the case may be. Amen. Verses, numbers, uh, let me see three. This is the verse we wanted. Ye ask, ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask the midst. Or ye, or ye ask... Um, off target. That's what he's saying. It's not that it was not something they could not receive. It was that they were asking the wrong way and their behavior was such that they were doing everything they could to get it. You get the picture? This is how it works. Somebody wants something so bad that they pray and ask God for it and when God does not give them the answer that they want, they try to find the way to attain it themselves. That's a dangerous place to be. And I've learned this. Be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And sometimes God will let a person get what they want to show them that they didn't actually need it. Somebody, somebody say, you prayed for a headache and got one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look at that. Let me get off that. You get the picture? Praise the Lord. So let's keep reading here. That they may what? Consume it upon their what? Your lust. Now let's go to Matthew. Show you how we should pray. Somebody say to be effective. There's a format to our prayer. This is a very familiar passage of scripture. Let's go to Matthew. I think it's chapter 6. It's what we want. Praise the Lord. Say, I want my prayers to get through. Praise the Lord. I want God to hear me. See, it, it makes absolutely no sense to pray with no purpose, with no aim. Praise the Lord. Because the time that we spend in intercession and supplication before God should be a time of us being built up on our most holy faith. In order to be able to walk in this world because prayer is essential for the success of the child of God. Prayer is like this. It's like building a relationship. It's one of the two of building a relationship with God. Just like when I met my wife and I wanted to know her, I picked up a phone. Now, I'm, I'm giving you a testimony because I was crazy. I picked up, I, I was in love. That was my problem that I would be up to 2 o'clock in the morning while she's in Virginia talking on the phone and had to go to work the next day. What was I doing? I was, what? I wasn't lusting, praise the Lord. Praise the, let's, let's get that straight. No, I was building a relationship. Just like when we get down to pray, praise the Lord, and we talk to God, 
we're building a relationship. He's talking to us, we're talking to him. And the reason why individuals don't know God like they should is because they spend no time talking to him. So, so it is in the natural, so it is in the, somebody say the spiritual. Praise the Lord. Just like if I wanted to know something about my wife or I wanted to know something about Bishop Julian, my father, then I had to spend time talking to him. Praise the Lord. In order for us to know one another. Same thing goes with God. But when we communicate with God, there's a certain type of communication we need to have to make it effectual or profitable on our half. Because God doesn't get anything out of me talking to him. I get everything out of it. <laughs> he is no more diminished by me not speaking to him. Praise the Lord. He's still going to be God. He still has all the power. He still has all the ability to give me what I need. So it doesn't matter if I say, well, I don't want to talk to you. And God is going to continue to be God. But I would rather speak to him to get my needs met. Why? Because he has access to what I need. Did not the scripture say in one place that he will supply all our needs through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? So if I have a need, he's the only one that can give it to me. It makes sense for me to go to him and ask him. Like he said, in, like John said, James said, ye, um, uh, ye have not because ye what? Ask not. If we ask the right way, we may get something. Now let me give it to you like this. This is going to make the point when we read these verses. When our children were young and they wanted something from us, when they were very young and they first started talking, we started training them how to ask for things properly. I gave you the illustration of a baby. We love children, Sandy, because what is in us? Babies are not very nice. They're tyrants. They want what they want when they want it. And they don't care a thing about how you feel. They will scratch your eyes out. They will cry. It's in their nature. I want it. You're supposed to give it to me. But as they grow, we train them how to receive, ask and or receive things properly. We, when they come up to us and they say, well, mama, give me. You say, no. You, add, you say, may I have. Praise the Lord. You get the picture? Same thing goes with God. Praise the Lord. Are we not his children? Do, do not we belong to him? Does not he have the access to what we need? Praise the Lord. He has the power to give me what I need, or he has the power not to give it to me. So Jesus is going to make a powerful illustration here how to ask properly to receive that which you need, because everybody doesn't ask the right way. So prayers that are offered in the Spirit are prayers that are offered properly according to the will of God. Can the church say amen? All right, let's, I guess we can go back to verses 5. This is an illustration on proper communication before God to receive what we need. Because I need things from God that nobody else can give to me. Can the church say amen? The Bible said in one place, and let me give you an illustration of a job. The scripture said that it is the Lord that giveth thee power to obtain wealth. So if you need a job, go to the one that has all the wealth. Praise the Lord. Go to the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Go to the one that has the silver and the gold. Why? Because he can unlock the riches of this world for us. Now, the false prophet want to tell you God's going to make you rich, but you don't have to do nothing about it. No, you have to do something about it to get the rich, to get the riches of God. The scripture said, behold the ant, thou sluggard. So what is the exchange for receiving the riches of God? By the sweat of your brow, you'll earn your bread. Can the church say amen? Nobody is getting out of working, but God is the one that gives the power for us to get the wealth. He gives us the ingenuity. He gives us the mind. He gives us the strength. He gives us the intelligence to do the jobs that we do. I spent, what was it? About 15 years as an electrician. In all 15 of those years that I spent as an electrician, it was God that gave me the intelligence to keep me from getting electrocuted. 
Praise the Lord. You know, when you go, you call for the electrician because your power's out. He goes downstairs with his flashlight. He opens up your box. Praise the Lord. And he begins to tinker with your wires. He can't see the electricity, but it's there, trust me. Because I've been shocked before, and it doesn't feel good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But in any case, it was God who gave me the ability to do that. That's an illustration of God supplying our needs. And, of course, I prayed for a job, and God gave me a job. But I, I could have been sitting there by, this, by my bed saying, Lord, give me some money. Praise the Lord. Bless me. I need some. Praise the Lord. Give me what I need. And God would tell me, get up off of your lazy backside and go, get it, go and get a job. Can the church say amen? See, these young men need to understand that. These brothers out here lazy and want these women to take care of them. Y'all, I, I, Can I get amen? amen? Praise the Lord. Now, let me get off that. That's not our subject. Read. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone that does not practice what they say. And the Bible said the hope of the hypocrite fails, according to the 8th chapter of the book of Job. Read here. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So what is an improper prayer? An improper prayer is a prayer that is prayed with the expectation to be seen of men. That's the illustration he's using. Any prayers that are prayed from some, for men to see the demonstrative exposition, or how can I say, it, uh, outward show of our ability to communicate with God, those prayers are not answered. Praise the Lord. It's not saying that you should not pray vocally. It's saying the fact that some people are praying for the purpose of people to see them when they pray. This was an actual happening in that day. They would literally go out into the street corners and they would do a ritual so that men could see them. Praise the Lord. Not that God would see them so that people could see them. And God knows when people are doing that. Let's, let's see the flip side of the coin here. Read. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to the Father which seeth in secret. See, the, the, one of the issues that we're facing today, this is, I'm giving you this as a, as a whole, is that a lot of times people want the reward of men for what they do. When we pray, saints, the point that he's making is that the only reward that we get are the prayers that God sees, not man sees. You get the picture? So the closet here is not a literal place. It is a spiritual place. It is in the heart of the believer. As we get into the presence of God, when we get in the presence of God, in, in the throne of grace, as the scripture said, the door is shut where nobody sees it. But God sees it. And God who sees in secret rewards us openly through his blessing that everybody can see. Praise the Lord. Have you met somebody say, well, um, well they, they went and prayed for somebody. But they want to make sure the person knows they're praying for them. So they go, well, I was praying for you. Well, why don't you just pray for them and don't tell them? And let God, who saw your prayer in secret, reward you openly. That you got your reward. If I go around and say, I'm praying for you, and you look for the blessing because I'm the prayer, and I'm, that's me doing that. Praise the Lord. You see the picture? I'm trying to illustrate. I'm trying to be a little bit animated tonight. See, the point of praying in the Spirit is getting into the presence of God so that God can be glorified and meet the needs of his people. And the point that he makes in these scriptures, not only in our prayer, but he also makes the point in our giving. Everything is in secret with God. Praise the Lord. We pray in secret. God rewards us openly. But we have to 
come into a place where we're willing to let God get the glory. That's the point. When people are praying in such a way that they want everybody to know what they're doing, they announce their prayers. You ever met somebody like that? They're getting behind pulpits. I, I, I'm a divine healer, and I'm going to pray for you. There's no such thing as a divine healer. God is the divine healer. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to tell you that they have the ability to heal you. Well, I got a brood for them. Let me give you this. Put this on the tape. Down at Butterworth Hospital, there are people that are laying in bed with fourth stage cancer. You're a divine healer, right? Why don't you go down there and lay hands on all them people? You're a healer. You said you're a healer, right? Go down there and heal them because you have the gift of healing. It's in you. It is your gift. Go do it. Praise the Lord. You get the picture? That is an illustration of individuals praying, like he said, in the synagogues, in the open, because they want people to see them. When we pray in the Spirit under the influence of the Holy Ghost, we pray in a secret place within our heart. Sometimes it is vocal. Sometimes it is within the mind of the believer. It's all within the mind. Sometimes we vocalize it. Sometimes we don't. But we are in a secret place. And God who sees in secret rewards you openly. Why? Because if it's done properly, it will always be for his glory. It will always be so that he would be glorified, so that he would be honored, so that he would be praised. Can the church say amen? Let's finish reading here. Mm-hmm. Shut the door about thee and thy father. Uh, uh, pray uh, to thy father, which, which, uh, which is in secret. Excuse me. Which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, which shall reward thee openly. Or he rewards you in a place where your blessing can be seen, however he chooses to give it. Read verses numbers um. Seven, read, but when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard by their much speaking. See, when we pray, we should not pray aimlessly. We should not pray scripted prayers. We should pray under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In those days, they were praying prayers in a repeated fashion, scripted. Written, praise the Lord, we should let the Holy Spirit come in. Creeds, doctrines, rules of order, these type of things. You ever heard of that? Well, I got a, I got a prayer for you. I, just, I'm, I wrote it out for you. You keep praying this, and then God's going to hear you. Praise the Lord. We should be praying under the influence of the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Spirit guide our prayers. That's the point he's trying to make. Because the heathens were doing this thinking, the more they pray, the more God, the, the closer uh, uh, how can I say God was going to hear them if I can use that terminology or God was going to hear them if they keep asking now, let me give it to you like this anybody ha ever had a child in here that thought that the more they the more they asked for something they were going to get it I have four of them praise the Lord <laughs> let me, I better stop using my kids praise the Lord you get the picture we were there mama Mama, mama, daddy, daddy, daddy. And what did that do? It just made you more determined not to give them what they want. Isn't that right? You get the picture? But they thought that they would be heard by their what? Much speaking. That's the point. If God doesn't want to give it, it doesn't, how, it doesn't matter how many times we ask. Praise the Lord. Now let's get down to the, somebody say the nitty gritty. Verse number eight. Be not, uh, be not uh, ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of. See, the point here, we're talking about praying, in the Holy, praying under the influence of the Holy Ghost or praying in the Holy Ghost. And you notice he says here, saints, let's read it again. But he says, but, but, uh, he says, but not be uh, therefore like, be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of. So God knows what we have need of. Hence, 
when we started this Bible study, most of our prayers should not be prayed for what we have need of because God knows what we have need of. Hence, the most effective prayers that we can pray is prayers and supplication in the Spirit for all saints because it is in those type of prayers that God comes in and intercedes for the needs of the church. And in turn, him knowing what we have need of, he meets our needs without even asking. Praise the Lord. So get a prayer list. People that you, need to, that you want God to do something for, pray for those people, and then watch how God works out what you need in your life. Can the church say amen? This is a practice that works repeatedly because the scriptures affirm it. Can the church say amen? This, this, there will never be a time when we will not have um, uh, uh, individuals that don't need prayer. Can the church say amen? So let's look at here now how Jesus gives them, somebody say a format. Formula or format as to how to approach God. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a question? Yes. Well, I can't say that it's necessarily wrong to, to tell them, but make sure uh, you should have the right attitude in telling them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nothing wrong. You, let, let me qualify so you can understand. Now... I was using that as an illustration from the standpoint of sometimes individuals do that for their own personal boasting of themselves. Now, somebody asks me to pray, and I pray for them. And I may go up to them and say, well, sister, I'll be, I'm praying for you. I'm not saying that because I want her to know that, it is, that, that I'm doing something great. I'm just simply making the point that I'm interceding for her. I was using that as an illustration because there are some who do, do it because they want everybody to know that they have such a great prayer life. You get the picture? That happens. So let me qualify. So it's nothing wrong with, 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 with if God, and I'll tell you this, if God puts it on your heart, but we should not be going around saying, well, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. We don't need to do all that because if the Holy Spirit directs you to speak to that person, say, I'm praying for you, sis, or I will be praying for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just have to make sure we have the right spirit in doing it. Because these individuals in the scriptures that we're dealing with were, were praying in such a way where they wanted to be seen. And, and I, I use that, and I went to the extreme somewhat, because we're living in a day where people do stuff so that people could see them doing it. And we know when that takes place. So when we pray, we should be praying so that God would be glorified, not that we would be seen as though we're, as Bishop uh, James Johnson used to say, some big shot in the church. Because there is no big shots in the church. Jesus is the big shot. We all small shots. Praise the Lord. All right? And then he goes on to say, does that answer your question, sis? All right. All right, let's finish reading here. Read. Um, let's go down to drop down to verses numbers uh, 9. After this manner, therefore, pray. pray. So the term therefore means for this reason. So he uses the illustration that he gave them from verses number five all the way down to show them therefore or for this reason, this is the way you should pray. This is the way you should approach God. All right, read. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the first thing that we do in our prayer, we acknowledge who we're speaking to. We get, we, this is how we enter into the throne of grace. We enter into the spirit of God. We acknowledge that we're speaking to God. And whenever I'm speaking to God, I should humble myself, come down, and realize that I'm speaking to the God of glory. Praise the Lord. Read here. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. So we're praying what? God's will. Now, at this particular point, there is no, how can I say, there is no emphasis on what I want. Praise the Lord. And most of our prayers should be in this area where we're praying God's will. Because when we get into the presence of God, we're praying, saints, for the glory of God to be seen, for God's purpose, for God's kingdom. The kingdom is what the church, praise the Lord, this is how we enter into the presence of God. And nothing has been said about what I need. Everything is about the kingdom at this point. So the bulk of our prayer should be about God's glory, what he desires, what he needs, what he wants to be accomplished. Then he goes on to say here, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt to us. Now we're getting to what we need. Praise the Lord. But before we ask what we need, we're praying what God's will be done. Read here. Then he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us evil. We're praying that God would what? Keep us from evil. Keep us from the influence of the world. Keep us from those things that are contrary to the will of God. You see the flow of, the flow of one's prayer? He's giving them a format of how to get in the spirit. Praise the Lord. Read here. Mm-hmm. For thy, uh, what did he say? For thy king, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we start out with God's glory and we end with God's glory and or, and or his purpose and or what he desires and or what he wants so that he will somebody say be glorified. Can the church say amen? With that, I could enter into more, but I would have to switch the subject here. Let's go now to Hebrews. I guess I'll give you this as we leave. Jesus made an intercession once at the end of the world, and now he uses us to do that job. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 9, verses um, 26. Hope I'm making sense here. Jesus inter interceded once in the days of his flesh. Now he uses us to intercede in this world right now, the church. We intercede through our prayers for the church for the world, so that God would be glorified. Praise the Lord. The old adage was that God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. He has no mouth but our mouth. Isn't that right? So God is going to use you. He's going to use me to get the job done. He's going to use you. He's going to use me to pray for somebody. He's going to use me. He's going to use you so that somebody can be saved. Can the church say amen? And we don't have to know, uh, Bishop, what the needs are. We just need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Now, I want to give you this scripture to show you that Jesus did it once in the end of the world when he entered into heaven itself, making intercession. Then he turned that responsibility over to the church to intercede on the behalf of others. Let's read here verses numbers 26. Read, for then, uh, for, said, for then months he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, what? To put away uh, sins by the sacrifice of himself. He came in the end of the world to put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. And so he did this, what was it? Once in the end of the world. Now, when we come back next, next week, Friday, I'm going to show you a couple of terms to make the point of what the end of the world is. The end of the world is when Jesus Christ came. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is just going to be destroyed. What that means is it's God's last attempt to reconcile men. And God is doing that reconciliation as we speak. Somebody say through the church. Praise the Lord. But he, he started it in the end of the world in the days of his flesh when he came. And then let's drop down here. Uh, let me see here. Do I want to go? No, we won't go to verses numbers um, 28. I guess we'll stop with that so we don't have to get in anything new. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. It's okay. Mm-hmm.